Hey friends, there's something new from our sponsor, Text Control. Their new product, DS Server, provides document services out of the box for all platforms and languages. Whether you want to integrate document creation, editing, sharing, or collaboration into your web app, DS Server provides the back-end technology to integrate that professional document processing. For example, using DS Server, you could integrate an MS Word-compatible document editor into pure JavaScript, Angular, or an ASP.NET Core application. You can create PDF documents using web API calls or even request electronic signatures from end users. DS Server is also hosted on-premise in your infrastructure or with your cloud provider, such as Microsoft Azure. And you can test DS Server without downloading anything. Create your first DS Server application in minutes by requesting a trial token on their dedicated website at dsserver.io. That's DS. S-E-R-V-E-R dot I-O. Hey friends, I'm Scott Hanson, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm talking with Nicholas Hunt Walker, who's a senior software engineer at Verica, and... You have a degree in astronomy. In fact, you have a master's degree in astronomy and spent years and years and years investigating the structure of the Milky Way. Clearly, that's how you become a Python developer. <laughs> Actually, yeah. <laughs> how does that work? In, in astronomy, there, um, back then, in, in the long eight years ago or 10 years ago that, when I started at grad school, astronomy has a programming language that a lot of people used called IDL. Um, which is a proprietary language. You need a license to, on your computer to use it. Um, you have to pay for that license, and it's not cheap. Um, I hated IDL. It was awful. Uh, and at the time, Python was starting to become the new hotness in astronomy. It's free, right? So you can just download it and start using it. You don't have to, you don't have to pay for a license or consult anybody. You just download it, and you're, you're going. And so I started learning Python so I could do astronomy. It was a tool. It was a tool. Yeah, we did the, uh, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with the Jupyter Notebooks. Absolutely. Big fan. I love right. Jupyter Notebooks. It's like digital paper. It's like it's prose, it's code, it mixes. Exactly. exactly. And all my research was in Jupyter Notebooks. You could actually go on my GitHub and sift through my poorly named uh, uh, grad school files <laughs> and see what I was working on. But yeah, it was it was all just like writing functions to ingest data from uh, CSV formats. Uh, and or from or directly from databases, I got better and learned more about how computers worked, um, and then making plots of you know like uh, uh, photo, pho- photographic color versus photographic color, which is like just a, the subtraction of two different colors, mm-hmm. uh, or or um, once I actually got distances of stars, like physical x distance versus physical y distance with the galaxy, that sort wow. of thing. When you're doing this, are you thinking, like, as you're slapping the keyboard, you're like, I'm coding, or are you like, I'm doing astronomy? It's more, I'm doing astronomy, but it's really like, oh my God, I'm running this function for the 50th time. Okay. So it's about avoiding repetition, let the computer do the work. Try so, it. like, slowly you're becoming a coder and you're not even realizing it, or do you just like, you're Googling for stuff, and the next thing you know, you're on Stack Overflow, and then you wake up and you're a programmer? It's, you know, I would hesitate to call myself a coder at that level because it was really like, it was really just the tool. It was just the means to an end. Mm, like an you Excel know, macro do, where it's like, okay, this, this exactly. Excel sheet got really complicated, but I'm not a coder. I just like did some formulas and it worked out. Right. And so I didn't know about like testing. I barely knew about Git. I didn't really know much about even about how computers work. It was, I, just, I knew that I had some numbers in some columns and some rows. And I needed to ingest them in certain ways. And I needed to have access to them in certain ways. Uh, and at some point in time, I need to make a, a, a figure, like a diagram out of it. And so I need, to, I need to know as much as I need to know to get to that point from A to B, from, from CSV file to XYZ plot. So you're investigating the structure of the Milky Way. You've, fin- you've done your, your graduate school. You've done your master's degree. You're thinking maybe PhD. You're writing code. But then you, how, what, how does that lead into actually teaching front-end web development? Right. So actually, so when you're, when you're going through astronomy PhD programs, uh, typically the, the whole point is to get the PhD. You'll, you'll pick up the master's along the way, typically. Oh, okay. So you're not thinking, I'm going to get a master's. Pause. Oh. Now I'm going to get a PhD. You know, it's, it's I'm in grad school. Oh. oh, I'll take my qualifying exam. Now I have a master's. 
Now I just do research until I get this PhD. That's amazing. I yeah. just, as a as a community college person who took eleven years to get an actual bachelor's degree, and you know, that's the idea that I'd like. Oh, I guess I got my master's on this random Tuesday. As I a, thought my seven yeah. was bad, but you did eleven. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, I don't know how it works with you, but like after seven years, I started losing credit off the back end because there's like oh, a yeah. circular because they would call me and they'd say, "Hey." you know, you need to take writing 121 again. And I'm like, why? Well, that that expired because there's this rolling window. You have to finish the four-year degree in seven years. That's so I wild. had to make a deal with the dean. <laughs> if I kept teaching classes, they would let me, I was actually the only non-degreed teacher. I was an adjunct professor, they call it. Mm -hmm. And then I taught classes for four years while finishing my degree. And in that process, I held off all these these lower credits from falling off the end. It's just part uh, of the whole academia little dance. I'm sure you had to do similar things. I, you know, not, not too much. Um, I, so just to take it back, if you want to see my, my whole securitist route, I started going to college at SUNY Binghamton way back in 2003. I spent a year and a half there uh, and failed out because I was depressed and then took about six months off uh, working in retail. So I could get a taste of how the real world hurts uh, and then, and then I also went to community college uh, nice. at Queensboro in uh, in New York, in New York, uh, Queens, and I spent a year and a half there. And initially, I was just I was going to just be an accountant. You know, I was uh, I was dead set on being just a bomb ass accountant. And then I had to take a natural science credit to get my associate's degree. And I was like, let me take the easiest thing I can find on this list of classes. Oh, astronomy looks easy, right? Um, and I had been like a pre—I had, I had done pretty good at physics in high school. I did—I did, I did a, I think I was a three or four in the AP exam. I knew—I knew what I was talking about, so it was like it was like a no-brainer for me. But I was in the class, and I found myself actually being interested. You know, it's a shame when that happens. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, threw my, it threw my whole life's trajectory off course. And so, I the, at the end of the class, the teacher was like, "Hey, you want to like do summer research?" And I was like, "I'm an accountant." What are you talking about? <laughs> but I was like, yeah, all right. I like astronomy well enough. And I did the research. I was like, I need this injected straight into my veins every day for the rest of my life. And so from that point on, I just decided to just, I'm going to be an astronomer. Yeah. And you were a fan. Like when you discover that you're a fan, like mm -hmm. people are like, no, you, you should try this. You would love it. You would be a fan. Like, no, that's not my thing. My whole plan was stand up comedy. <laughs> I lettered in drama. I actually have like a letterman's jacket. Like for those who are overseas right now, you get a jacket with the sport that you are like, you know, basketball or football or whatever. My sport was drama. So I got like the little happy face, sad face <laughs> jacket, which yeah. like makes you look like a jock until people get close and they realize you're just a drama nerd. <laughs> and then I, my dad sold his van and bought me a Commodore 64. And I was like, inject this directly into my veins. <laughs> Ne not a plan, right? It's just a, it's like when being prepared and opportunity presents itself, right? And then well, you so, take it. So that that's what happened again because I was I was on my on my astronomer path and I was deep in I was like five out of like four years into grad school, and I was just I was pretty miserable actually. You know I don't know if you know this, but grad school grad students aren't the best paid people in the world. I've heard that, right? So I was I was broke, um, not poor, but broke, uh, and. Uh, I needed, I was, my, my girlfriend at the time was going to be moving in with me from across country. And I was like racking my brain about how I'm going to afford this new lifestyle of mine. And then my brother would, was, would always tell me like, Hey, if you learn my SQL PHP JavaScript, I'll pay you to make websites. Like, you know how to code. I can, you can learn this other stuff and do stuff for me. And I was like, I will do that. And so for four months from like March, 2014 to, to uh, June, July, July, I would wake up at 6 a.m. I would study, 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 study until 10. Then I'd go in, do my research, come back home, study till I slept. And then summer hit, and he was like, okay, you're ready. And he would give me the, the PDFs of the websites he wanted me to build, and I'd build them. Mm. And that was my first taste of like doing web development. I was like, this is kind of this is kind of dope. Because like my our parents our mom in particular is, a, is an artist through and through. Now she didn't end up doing art for, for a profession, but she went to like Pratt university. She knows how to draw really well. She still does uh, illustrations here and there, but she taught us to have an appreciation for the arts. I and mean, we're, we're both fairly creative people. Um, but 
I hadn't really exercised that being a scientist. I mean, science was great, but there's not a lot of like, I'm, I'm not going to make wonderful illustrations of the galaxy. My simulations do that, right? Um, but I found in doing front end web development, like, oh, I can actually be creative again. I can use color and certainly and and, uh, and manipulate CSS and make the web page look exactly how I want it to look. And that kind of like lit a new fire in me. And the same thing was like, I kind of I kind of want this directed directly in my veins again, hmm. you know. But I'm but I'm deep in this thing. Like, so now I have this dilemma, right? You know, that's a really important thing that you're bringing up, because I think as people are listening uh, who are either engineers or maybe you're listening to the show and you're thinking about being an engineer, you may be thinking that this is all about the hard sciences and, you know, you need to learn algebra and you learn this and that. And computers are hard is a thing that everyone's been saying for all this time. But it is truly a uh, a discipline where it's it's half hard engineering and it's half creativity. We really do get to be creative. You know, not every job has such a nice mix of interesting science and reliable physics and how things work Mm -hmm. and being totally creative, having sparks of creativity, having moments of creativity, really being able to express yourself with this difficult tool that we have. Right. Yeah. And I, I I learned to appreciate that very deeply, especially Mm -hmm. as like I was, I was getting like full on depressed in my, in my grad school program. And I, I was starting to look for a way out, but you know, when you're in grad school, they, they train you to be an astronomer. Like, what else would they train you for? You're in astronomy PhD programs. So I needed to jump ship to something that was familiar. Mm. Um, and the choices were like data science or web development. Because data science is close enough to astronomy. You know, you, have to, you still have to learn some things. But it was close enough to astronomy where, like, I've, I've, I've analyzed some data. I've done science with some data. I could do data science. Sure. But I also had this other skill where I was like, oh, I've been building websites for the last year and a half now, mm-hmm. you know, part time, but I have some skill there. I kind of know what I'm talking about. I can do something with this. And so I, I decided to leave in March of 2016. I decided to leave um, like, a, like a thief in the night, <laughs> my grad school program. Like literally, I just kind of like didn't come back. <laughs> um, so what, and, what is that, does that mean you're ABD or you got your master's, you're on your way? And then you technically up until the end of last year, I, I could have gone back to my, my doctorate. But I just, yeah, all all about dissertation, yeah. Um, but I had, I had interviewed for some, for some companies. I was I was actually like looking at offers between one where it was like teaching web development, and the other one was doing data science for this other company. But they were they were a little slow, and I wanted the job now, so I was like, okay, I can teach. I have the skill. I can do I can do programming. Um, let me join Code Fellows and teach web development, and I did mm-hmm. that for the next two years. Here's an interesting note, though. People don't read as much into their CVs and their LinkedIn's as I do, but I research all my guests. And one of the things that I noted was that around 2014, as you're doing this work for your your brother, one of the things that you wrote, probably just wrote it, didn't think about it, was ensured sensible user flow with JavaScript. Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. Sensible user, like common sense. You're using empathy. You're thinking about design. And I think not every engineer comes with a sense of their own empathy and how their code will be used downstream of them. We write a lot of code. You have to, you have to, it's, yeah. I know it's not explicitly part of the job, but it needs to be because everything you build is going to be used by, even if it's just used by you, mm-hmm. you know, you have to think about if I'm, if I'm me six months from now and I've completely forgotten everything that I was thinking about when I was writing this code, am I going to be able to use it? You know, am I going to understand if, if the functions named MB Am I going to know what that means? Am I going to know what these variables do? Am I going to know what what the output's supposed to be and where it's supposed to go? What's the intent here? Um, you, you have to think about that. You can't just like it's very easy to just to just adhere to the strict requirements of whoever's handing something to you, mm-hmm. and just say, "Okay, I did the thing. Here you go." It's like no. When you hand it off, someone's got to use that. Yep. Whether it's an internal user or an external one who has no idea what you wrote and has no contact with you, you know, you, you're you're building an interface for somebody. And you've expressed this to me before, and I want you to bring up this term before. You've called it thinking about your blast radius or mapping out the blast radius. What does that right. mean, your blast radius? Yeah, I mean, so like you, you you make let's say you make this doodad and you drop it in someone's hands. And now they now they're going to use it. And 
if you're if you're if it's a product that's like direct to the user, then your blast radius is the user and whoever they're going to interact with with through your program. If you're working in more of a, a larger company, then you have to think about who is touching this, who's going to be influenced by it, who's going to be maintaining it when I'm gone. Um, how is it how is it going to evolve from end to end? And so you can't you can't make things without thinking about who you're going to affect when you make them. And it could be a, it could be something as simple as I'm going to write, write documentation that's very easy to understand so that when someone's looking at this in, in the absence of me, they're not going to be completely baffled by what they see. It could also be like, I'm going to write tests so that someone can be assured that the code works the way it's supposed to work when it's being run. Mm-hmm. It could be... Um, I'm going to build this interface so that someone who's never written a line of code in their life, like a, like a store manager can understand what's being done and can do the thing they intend to do and can, and it's not going to slow them down on their job. It's not going to suddenly uh, throw their whole day out of whack because a lot of people, a lot of people who aren't in my position are running on, you know, some tight schedules on, on some, you know, very prescribed, like I have to do this, then do this, then do this, then do that. And if the thing that I write is screwing up their step two, then it's also screwing up their step three and four and five and six and seven. And it's going to affect who they're managing because maybe what, what I wrote is going to trickle down to them. It's going to affect uh, the people who, who oversee them because now it's affecting their performance. So, yeah, like you, you don't want to deploy software willy-nilly. You want to think about who's going to use it and who's going to be touched by it. Incidents happen fast, but they don't come out of nowhere. If they're watching, your team can catch the sudden shifts in performance, but who has time to constantly check thousands of hosts, services, and containers? That's where New Relic Lookout comes in. Part of full-stack observability, it compares current performance to past performance, then displays it in a statewide view of your whole system. Sign up free at newrelic.com and start moving faster than ever. I've had folks on the show before, uh, notably Keisha Rogers, who talked about systems thinking. And she said that we, we spend a lot of time trying to teach people how to code, but not a lot of time teaching people how to think about systems and those systems and nested dependencies within mm-hmm. those systems. Do you think that that's true? I do. And it's because it's very easy to become divorced from the fact that the, you're, you're writing code, you're writing these functions, you're writing these classes, whatever, and it becomes a product or a module, right? It, it's, it's a Lego, you know, and the Legos fit together in a specific way uh, or c- can fit together in a, in, a, in a myriad of ways. But like, you have to think about the concept of what you're building. Um, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter that you can write the most efficient code unless, unless that's your job to do that. It matters that you can build a thing that could fit in the right way Mm-hmm. Uh, and it can be explained to other people so they can th- so that they can take it away from you and fit it where they need to fit it without it breaking everything. Mm-hmm. Were you always wired like that to think about things in that way? Or did you decide that? <laughs> I don't I, I don't remember ever deciding it. I think it's just it's it's a manifestation of my life's experiences. Mm. The reason I ask is that on your on your Twitter you have a pinned tweet. And you said, and I'll, I'll read that tweet and we can talk about it. You said, I've said this before and I will say it many more times. You are what you regularly do. If you want to be a better version of yourself, incorporate growth in that direction every day. Identity lies in daily practice. Mm-hmm. So are you a programmer now? Yes. <laughs> yeah. But you have a graduate degree in astronomy. But this you're thinking about the systems, you're thinking about the systems that you build, that you create, and the blast radius of those systems as well. My astronomy training has made me a scientist. And when you are a scientist, you have to think, you, you, you naturally come into some systems thinking. Because you have, especially if, if you're at the, at the level of you're trying to train for your PhD, you have to think about, you know, I, I, can't, I can't just, if I'm, if I'm looking at the interior of a star, for example, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, how a perturbation uh, moves 
through the various layers of a star, I don't have to think about all those layers of the star. What's what's the density at, at layer A, B, and C, and D? What's the temperature? What's the pressure? How does this propagate outward? What are the effects? What are the what are the effects in multiple d- dimensions? What are the effects when that wave leaves that star? You know, that kind of thing. And so, you know, you go through all this training, you learn all these equations, and all these equations tell you what those do. And you practice them over and over and over again for years at a time. So that's what makes me a scientist is just having that practice behind me. And now what makes me a programmer is the fact that I write code every day. Um, What makes me a good systems thinker is that I can combine the analytical side of the science and and understand the concept of what I'm building and figure out how how that fits into whatever product I'm trying to put out or whoever I'm trying to help or whatever the case may be. It's also what makes what may be a decent teacher. I, I would say I'm, I'm a good teacher, but you know, you just contact some of my students for that. <laughs> but well, that's actually one of the things I'm trying to normalize. Like people should be able to compliment themselves. Like it's not like an egotistical thing. If it's true. Sure. And if you feel a good, if you feel good about it and if you're, if it's part of your identity, like I fancy myself a good teacher. I think mm-hmm. I'm good at analogies and breaking down things. But, you know, you don't want to like toot your horn too much, but I'm like, yeah, I'm good at that. And like, you know what you're good at. And we should yeah. know that and we should own that and talk sure. about that. Yep. I'm a good teacher. There you go. Um, I have been a good teacher in the past. And one of the things that made me a good teacher is, as you said, the ability to break things down and have good analogies. But even even that that is systems thinking. Even that is is figuring out what your blast radius is. Because when you're teaching, so you're trying to teach to a class of like 30 people. You have to figure, you have to think about like, okay, I'm going to explain this in a way. Mm-hmm. And this is going, this is going to resonate with maybe like six, seven people. But I'm not teaching six, seven people. I'm teaching 30. And so I have to, I've got to check in. I've got to provide alternate examples. I've got to make sure that when I, when I introduce a new concept, I'm doing it at the, the most basic level that I can think of without derailing my, my, te- my, my pedagogy, right? Uh, and then, like when I when I assign homework, I can't just like set it and forget it. I've got to check in with my students and make sure that they're that they're with it because it's like when when you're when I was teaching at Code Fellows, I was teaching mostly adults, but everyone is a product of their experiences. And most people, especially in the United States, when you come up through our grade school system, you tend to learn to like do things to get the grade. And not necessarily understand the the whole purpose behind the assignment, and so I don't want my students to just get the grade. I would tell my students all the time, "Listen, if you want to get an A, we can figure out how to get you an A, but it's not going to get you a job. I want you to get a job, and in order for you to get a job, you need to understand what you're doing. And so when I when I assign this to you, I'm not just being a sadist. I'm I'm trying to give you an example of how something should work. Mm. And if you're not understanding what what what's trying to happen, you're like I've, I've I've made a mistake. I've done an oopsie. Yeah. And I need to sit with you and figure out how to, how to make you understand this thing. And now once I've gotten you to understand it, I'm going to bring that understanding to the rest of the class too, to make sure that they can get it too. Yeah. We're currently trying to work that out with our 13 year old and our 15 year old. Our 15 year old <laughs> is starting to understand that the assignments exist to improve understanding. <laughs> while the 13 year old is playing the game. And sure. Like, literally calls it that. He's like, yeah, I got straight A's. Like, how did you do it? Well, I played the game. Like I did, I did whatever manipulations and machinations that I needed to do to achieve the required result. Sure. But Which, like, you know, it's a skill. That's it's valuable. Good. It's a cool, but I'm like, but are you geeked about a topic? Like, is there a thing you're particularly excited about? And he's like, no, I just want to play Minecraft. <laughs> we'll get it. We'll I get mean, it it's an honest response, but yeah, it's it like you, you, you want to get him to see the value, whether it's a kid or an adult trying to learn something, you want to see, you want them to see the value in the lesson. And that's the challenge, right? So if the goal here is to get more people excited about tech, it's about normalizing normal people coding, which mm-hmm. is the thing I'm excited about. My friend mm-hmm. Grace said we should normalize normies coding. <laughs> like, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be like a certain kind of person. You can be anybody. Mm-hmm. Then in doing that, you have to have people think about these this blast radius, this systems thinking and all mm-hmm. the things that are involved. And that's a hard thing to teach. And if you're not, careful you can inadvertently put up gates and barriers to entry yes, absolutely you know like my son's excited about learning to drive like he's 15 right so i want to talk to him all about engines and changing your oil and and changing the tire which is the gatekeeping that my dad did sure 
but in doing that, I'm going to ruin his excitement about driving because I'm right. going to say you can't and You got to think about him and what he wants. Like, exactly. If you're trying to introduce this new concept to people, you have to, you have to, you have to meet them where they're at, right? What are their interests? Why do they care about this? Are they trying to no. drive because they want to learn how a car works or they're trying to drive because they, they can go to the mall? Exactly. Are you trying to learn to code because you have a particular thing that you're interested, in, whether it be astronomy or you mm-hmm. know, helping the incarcerated or whatever the thing you're jazzed about? You might want to be a coder because you want to map the weather. And it's not mm-hmm. about the code. It's about the meteorology. Mm-hmm. Right. It's a, it's a means to win it. Sure. You might want to code so you can make money, which is perfectly fine and valid. But you need to and- learn... That's another thing we should normalize too, right? <laughs> Doing your job and punching out at 501 and not being like, I'm excited. You know this. I'm, I'm excited about code on the weekends. Mm-hmm. I'm excited if you're not excited about code on the weekends. And that's cool right. too. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it is a job, you know, and jobs exist to pay people. Someone, someone gets paid for work that they provide to a company or to a person yeah. or to, to some entity. So, yeah. But but if if someone if someone does want to code for the money, great. Figure out if you want to teach them how to code. Figure out okay, like what's what's paying, right? Like what's what are the projects that are paying, and how can I get this person to do that kind of a project? Right. But then there's that balance. But then you're my 13 year old, and you're playing the game, and you're like, yeah, I'm just trying to maximize profits, right? Like sure. What programming language should I learn that will get me paid the most? Sure. But that but that's when you start to introduce the long term view. Right, mm. like playing the game and getting the profits now is useful now, but it's not going to be as useful when you're 25. And so, how do you bridge that gap between 13? I want to just play Minecraft, and 25, I need to live a fulfilling life with, yeah. a, with a decent salary that that's 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 going to keep me sustained over the next 20, 30 years. Which brings up an interesting juxtaposition because here we are talking about you know I'm a certain level of years into my career, you're a certain level of years in your career, and with both of us, there was a plan, but also no plan at all. Yes. You know, people always ask me, like, hey, how'd you do it, handsome one? You, you planned all this? I'm like, really just made it up? Like, I plan a couple of months in advance, but <laughs> I'm not like the person who's like, I'm going to be a brain surgeon. I'm 13 now. The plan to be a brain surgeon is whatever. So I think it's interesting that both you and I kind of like bumbled into <laughs> our life work. Yeah. Like the we were ready, we were prepped, we had some systems thinking set up, we had some empathy, I think, but I didn't plan this. I thought I was going to be in the army, and then I thought I was going to be a firefighter, right. like my dad, my brother's a firefighter, my dad's a firefighter, and I know how to reboot the router. That's basically the, how they think of the Hanselman. Well, you know what the difference is? is? That you were ready to say yes to your interests, you know? You 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 saw you saw you know you said you're Commodore sixty four, mm-hmm. and you're like oh man we, we were having this conversation before like you're like I want this directly into my veins nobody now. else cares my brother firefighter doesn't care right really deeply like profoundly does not care but, <laughs> but, you, but you, got that, you got this little piece of the universe that was just shining to you and you're like yeah I'm going to take that not everyone not everyone can or or is willing to do that you know. Like if if I uh, like I love to play D and D as you know because you follow me on Twitter, I, like half my tweets are about D and D, but you know I'm not necessarily going to take that and want to become an actor from it because that's not really my passion. But right. someone else might play D and D. It's like oh I get to play a role and I get to be a character. I get to be a, be a whole person with a with a motivation, mm-hmm. a background, and enemies and weaknesses. Oh, this is just like acting. Maybe I can like start to parlay this into acting school and and find a coach who can teach me how to act and maybe yeah. do voice acting or, or 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 you know real life acting or theater acting or anything like that and and take it in that in that direction because they're ready to say yes to that interest see that's what i want for my kids that's what i want for the listener of the show mm-hmm. is i want them to find a thing that they're just geeked about you know i talk about the fandom not the fandom of like you know anime or or fandom of marvel universe or like the fandom of like whatever you're geeked about like there are people that are geeked about math and they're geeked about 3d printing or they're geeked about being a nurse or a doctor Mm -hmm. what i'm sad for is when people don't find a thing or they haven't been given the opportunity to try enough stuff yeah like if my kids want to try ballet and i discover that the 15 year old loves ballet and he never expected it but ballet just surprised him i would Mm -hmm. be thrilled with that so i want to give him as many different things to try so he can yeah. find the thing like you found programming in the middle of a middle of a graduate degree. 
Yeah. And, you know, part of that, part of that willingness to, to pursue a thing is, is also, that's also a skill, you know, like you, you have to build the skill of, of following threats, you know, of mm-hmm. Googling your way to victory. Like if I, if I want to know how a thing works or what a thing is, I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to say, okay, what is this thing? Mm-hmm. Like if I'm interested in like flipping houses, you know, I don't know anything about, about flipping houses, but there are people who know things about flipping houses. They've written about it. So I'm gonna, I can go to, I can go to Google and say, okay, flipping houses 101 and find resources about flipping houses. And now I have my first step into that territory. And then I can follow the resources because they always have references. They always have people you can talk to and talk about and see what they're talking about. What, what are their podcasts? What are these YouTube videos about? Right. What are these articles say? Find the enthusiast I, about that topic. You just got to figure right. out that that enthusiast, are they f- – full of crap or not. That's the challenge, right? Sure. Because everyone's always asking me like, hey, Scott, how can I learn how to code? I'm like, well, how do you know? I know what I'm doing. Like, I just want to, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have, there's no proof other than I'm old and I've been around a long time on the internet. Sure. You know, sure. if I wanted to go and learn about astronomy, I could go and Google about your work and look at the stuff you did in the past. I don't know if it was good or not. <laughs> <laughs> you could ask my old advisor if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that that's that is the challenge, right? You do have to have a certain BS detector. Sure. But I think if someone is enthusiastic over time consistently about a thing, mm-hmm. it's probably a good idea that, that maybe they would be the, the house flipper or the astronomer or the coder that mm-hmm. you should go and be excited about following. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fo- following that excitement. It's, it's you, got, you know, it's really you got to give people the opportunity. I think that's that's one of the major things that's missing. And people talk about this when they have conversations about like equity, you know, not like equity in stock, but more like equity in society. Mm-hmm. And giving people equal access to resources and to I- exposure to possibility. Bingo. You know, because if I if I never know that you know programming exists as a profession. Or hell, let's get away from programming. If I never know that I could actually make make a living being a a, a craftsman as a woodworker, then I'm, I'm never going to actually pursue it. Woodworking. Like this is why go. we like Star Trek: The Next Generation so much, because like the starship captain is talking to the person whose job is to be a a potter, you mm-hmm. know, and they're like, "What do you do? Oh, I do art." And they all have like equal access to food, and mm-hmm. they don't like worry about the rent. They're like, "Oh, right. what do you do? Glass blowing." How'd you know glass blowing? Oh, I was a starship captain. Then I discovered glass blowing. Oh, right. And so, so not only do they have equal access to food, and this is this is Star Trek Future, right? This is this is like the utopia of Earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like everyone's fed, everyone's housed, everyone has healthcare, but everyone also has equal access to information. You know, and so once you have, once you learn about this this random thing, you can say, oh, I can follow this. And I can find the next thing, and then I can find the next thing, and you you do it for a year. And now, like, oh, I'm actually kind of a I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I kind of, I kind of know what I'm talking about now. I've built my I've built my my the robustness of my BS detector. I can know who's going to say the real stuff and who's just kind of trying to make a make a buck, you know. Mm-hmm. And so that's like equity is the key there. If you want to build people to be anything, really, if you want if you want if you don't want to just have the same faces all the time, you just have to say okay, like who do I want to introduce to this? How can I get their interest? Yeah. How can I expose them to this world? And now that I've exposed them to this world, how can I start to feed them information or, or, or get them regular access to information so they can build their own internal model for how this whole world works? Yeah. See, that's why I like doing my YouTube and my podcast. And I'm, I'm like, I'm huge on the TikTok now. And that's what I'm going <laughs> to tell you. Because someone's going to scroll by and they're going to be like, huh, never thought about programming before. Yeah, that's you thing. never know. That's never know thing. who they do it. And, I, and, I, and no one's going to tell me. Like, I'm ne- they're not going to call me in 20 years. Maybe I'll bump into the 20 years and go, hey, I saw your TikTok. Became a programmer. Yeah. Moved moved west. Bought a house. You changed my whole life because of that stupid TikTok that you did. But yeah. wouldn't that be cool? Because then I expanded someone's blast radius. That, honestly, like, people might write that off as like, oh, you're Scott Hanselman. Of course it's going to happen. This is a thing that happens to anybody. I can tell you straight up. Like, when I was in grad school and I was interested in, like, I wanted to learn about personal finance because I was broke and I wanted to manage my money. I wrote a PowerPoint um, about like, okay, credit and budgeting and debt and investments. And I presented it to, to the SACNES, which is the uh, Society for the Advancement of Chicano Native American Students 
um, a society on, on campus. And then I also presented to, to the astronomy grad school students in my program. And then I put it on my website. And then I just left it alone for a couple of years. And then a couple of years later, someone out of the blue, never met him before, emailed me. It's like, hey, one of my students found this thing. Would you be willing to come speak uh, at, at Vanderbilt to the, to the black grad students there about- Years that, later. Years later. Right. You just left a digital fingerprint on the internet and forgot yeah. about it. This and is the thing about it. not wasting your keystrokes. <laughs> and someone right. just found it. And, right. and, and, and they found it useful. And- so like I, I went to Vanderbilt like two or three times over the next few years, giving this talk about, about like understanding personal finance for grad students, and I just got a tweet like last month or last week, two weeks ago, from someone who was at one of those talks, and he was saying like it transformed his life about how he thought about investments in his own his own money, and you know this is a random thing, but this is like you you have to. I, I didn't think about my blast radius when I was doing that. I just did it because I, it, it was self-interest. But when you leave the resources for people, you never know who's going to find it, and you never know who's going who's to help and who, whose life you can change. You know, Just because I, I wrote that thing and I, I had that initiative and I left it up, I've now able, been able to influence someone else's life entirely. And now they're, now they're thinking about how they can grow their own finances, and that's gonna, it's going to enable them to do things that they wouldn't have done on their own. Mm-hmm. You know, this is good stuff, sir. I appreciate you chatting with me, dude. I could talk to you for a, lo- a, a long time. I could, man. We're gonna, we're gonna hang out, man. This is like yeah. a thing. It's like a bromance now. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're ready. What do, we, what do we call it on Twitter? The moots. We're mutes. Yeah, we're mutes. <laughs> we're, we're we are we are now uh, hanging out, and people can hang out with you. They can find you on Twitter at Jim Hunt Walker. You are, in fact, the only Nicholas Hunt Walker <laughs> in existence. It actually says that on your Twitter. It's true. And people can follow you for uh, for hot takes on D and D and all kinds of <laughs> stuff that's happening. Uh, I have a variety of interests. And you, what do you do on Twitter? You follow the whole person. Yeah, this is true. I'm I'm always a little scared when people follow me, but I was like, okay, well, you, you came here. Dude, I am, you know, I'm like, people follow me for the tech and they stay for the Beyonce gifts. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at Ethan Walker pretty much everywhere. Yeah. So. Fantastic. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs> <laughs>